Uh, my name is Alan Kingston, and I was uh, born just over that hill, down the other side of the uh, the valley. And uh, the story, as they say, begins. We planted the first area down the bottom here, and then following in 2014, 2015, we planted the biggest mount. And here we are today, trees all around and standing in a very windy area. And it was traditionally known as the hay field. So this is why we need trees in this farm. Its location and the topography are providing it with uh, little shelter from surrounding areas. And it seems to be a funnel or a tunnel right through the farm. With 25,000 trees plus growing, we're, we're getting a small bit of shelter, a little bit of shade, a little bit of protection, but we need a lot more. So that's all fine. That's trees, that's the story, that's the farm. But what, what good is that to me? What good is it to my family? So the main objective was to get the kids out here, see what they like, start growing our food, start growing vegetables, fruit, introduce animals in the trees. And here we are today in one of the plots, which is uh, part of the recent plantation we did. Back in 2014, 2015, we introduced uh, two agroforestry plots in a nine plot uh, forest um, plan, you would say. So we, here we are in a silvo-arable plot, which initially struggled as of its location, as of the wind. And whatever is growing here today has basically survived the, the battles since it has been planted. So it being silvo-arable trial, we, we were at the time looking for options on what to introduce in between. So instead of, um, we'll say, tilling and using grains and all of this, in this part of West Cork, you won't see a lot of tillage being used for various reasons. So eventually, after time and thought and research, while lucky enough to be living in London, I found a model site in Kent, which this is based on. Uh, however, they don't have agroforestry there, here we do. So what we're looking at is a plantation where that the Aronia, as a horticultural enterprise and a berry crop or a cash crop, as you'll say, between the trees, will grow faster and provide shelter for the trees. It's a 20 year plant life for this uh, hedgerow. And at that point, our trees will have had the benefit of the aronia, and so will we. So, as it's happening, I'm standing here. This hedgerow is probably about four feet. This is its four chair. And we're uh, hopefully this year was the last year picking these berries by hand. There are machines, that's one of the reasons we. Uh, we chose this plant. The other reason is that they're, they're hardy, they're disease resistant to date, and they're one of the most uh, nutritious fruits, berries in the world, all research pointing at the same. Uh, the kids love them, uh, drinking the juice anyway, maybe not picking them, but uh, as they say, we, we can introduce the machine for that as we uh, as we grow along with them, as they say. So that's the story of this field. I mean, it's part of the story of the farm. The other areas around are all doing their own things and we're learning what we can introduce into each plot, not just the nine plots, but the remaining plots that are left as well. So again, this was a silvo arable trial, two fields away. We have a silvo pastoral system with some sheep in it. Uh, working quite well. The wind has calmed for a moment. So we, we've introduced here between 
this farm, um, my neighbour with the beef and my home farm being the dairy, a shelter belt this year with the help of uh, some trees from a project called Trees in the Land. We're, we're happy to be involved and we're happy to, to plant the shelter belt and provide more shelter from this tunnel we're standing in as it blows across the farm. So again, the trees have so many benefits to different species and how fast they'll grow and what they can provide in terms of shelter, in terms of um, shade, which the sheep in the other fields you might see in a minute are utilizing since we've introduced them. If we, start, if we speak about sheep, I mean, uh, it's, it's interesting, I never grew up with sheep, I never had sheep until two years ago, but I, I'm very happy so far working with this particular uh, species. They're called Shropshire. So again, it's a learning, it's an interest, it's, um, it's been a joy, I suppose, to date with them. However, touch wood, we've had no um, particular problems with them since we've introduced them to the trees or introduced them to the farm. Uh, they seem to be quite friendly. Um, the only thing is I, I'm clipping their toenails about twice a year and uh, it's, it's a job you don't imagine when you get sheep, but you have to, uh, as they say, go with what's uh, introduced or what they bring to the table. They're fertilizing, they're strimming, they're eating, they're finishing without concentrates. In this place, they tick all the boxes. As we've done from the beginning, and I suppose this might be a personal thing, I, I learned through visual observation and by making mistakes or as they would say, by trying something, I don't call it a mistake, some people might call it a mistake, but we, we try something, we learn from it, we make a decision whether we can work with it or not. So, um, I mean, the trees, at the moment, the shed is still standing, so the trees have protected the shed from the roof being lifted off it, which without them, I have no doubt, would be gone at this stage. The sheep are, on a wet day, lying in their beds under the trees. On a dry day, during the middle of the day, maybe like the Spanish or the Italians having a siesta under the trees. And on a sunny day, like us all, they're, they're under an umbrella, which is the tree in the shade. And to date, they seem to be quite happy and stress-free in that environment. I've noted how they, they feed, there's, there's patterns. So as it gets light, the dew is on the grass, the haze is there on the meadow, as they say. The sheep are out nibbling wet grass. They'll come back, they'll lie in the shade. They won't be found out grazing under the hot midday sun unless they're in a field. And we've had that early this year in the field next door, where that it's the biggest field we've still left on the farm without shade other than a goat willow on this nearest boundary. Now, they spend most of their time under that goat willow in that big field on the hot sunny days, instead of, as you would say, grazing the plot. They took shade, they were very careful about when they went out, and very careful about when they were in the shade. And I was observing this through, as they say, introducing a bucket of water, and introducing no water, and extra water, and monitoring all this. They were practically drinking nothing. You know, the only time that you'll see animals, and I've seen this in my brother's farm, if, if you turn out a herd of cows and there's no shelter on a summer's day, they're standing at the water truck, guzzling water all day long. Um, if, the shade are, if the shade is provided and the trees are there, I have a picture of them, there, were, there was 50 cows under an oak tree and another whatever's left out grazing one hot day this year. And if they have the shade, they'll use it. And they use it all the time for various different reasons, as do I, when I'm found out here without a jacket or without sunscreen, depending on the environment, depending on the weather, 
you'll take shade. Another incentive with, with forestry is that it's tax-free. So it's tax-free money and having, I suppose, an interest and a love and an understanding that we all need trees. It's very important. I mean, a lot of the things you'll see in this farm have been done, as they say, out of my pocket. But however, we wouldn't have been able to manage this without the aid from the, uh, the forestry department. Then the question of the farm. How can I make a living on this small holding without dairy or beef? You have to be creative. You can introduce trees, you can introduce horticulture, you can introduce food, you can introduce animals, you can introduce uh, products. My, my, my partner is a, is a product purchaser. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I have first-hand uh, uh, information on what will sell and what won't. What's needed? Who can grow it? Can we grow it? Who can produce it? Can you produce it? It was yesterday, I was driving through the nearest town, and I met, I met a woman that I had met probably 30 years ago, three, three decades. And I said, hey, stop the car. Come, I heard you were dyeing fabric, cloths, yes. I said, is it wool? Yeah. I said, I have sheep. What have you got? I said, Shropshire's. Nice wool. I said, you're dying. Yeah. I, I said, can you use these, these berry juice as a dye? She said, I look into it. I'll be back to you. By the way, I want some sheep for next year. She said, of next year's lambs. So this is what you're looking at. We have a bag of wool over there in a white bag that we were going to put under these berries to suppress the weeds for next year. We have wood shavings here, we're going to do the same with. And I said, we haven't found a good use for our, our wool as yet. Leave it with me. And this is what we're looking at. Another avenue, another product. And wouldn't it be fantastic if we can dye our wool for the weavers with the juice berries after taking the juice and shearing the sheep and clipping their toenails. I mean, it's, it's endless. There, there is no end to the opportunities here. And it's very exciting to think that you have a reason to stop someone you wanted to stop to talk to, but only for hearing that she uh, was dyeing fabrics, I wouldn't have made my point to stop. We had a great chat. We'll meet again. And that's what it's about. Community, uh, produce, abundance. Uh, very exciting. So we've introduced a pig, which again, through trial and research and information and talking and... We tried it. Uh, it's a pig called uh, Kune Kune, native to New Zealand. We've also tried, well I didn't, but I took it in. Someone crossed over a Kune Kune with some other species. And I've tried a litter of banners up there in one patch, and we can show you the photo evidence. Their noses are too straight and too long, and they're rooters, they're diggers. And unless you want to plow a field, I don't need them here. Now, having said that, they haven't upsided the trees either. They haven't harmed the tree. So there's still that natural inclination not to touch the tree. They'll hoe and they'll twist over a sod. They're a little bit more troublesome than, than, than I wish for, but they're still not harmful. They're the cleanest animal you'll ever find, and they are. And we'll have a look in a minute at their bedroom on the way out, the ones that are out in the agroforestry plot. Their bedroom, I would have no hesitation in crawling into and lying down and going to sleep there myself. It's spotless, absolutely spotless. So we're very happy to have those in different areas. Again, we have uh, some females, we have some males, so there's a breeding chain and there's a food chain. And that's the way it is if you breed animals and whether they're in trees or outdoors or indoors, that's what you're dealing with unless you you just use them for the duration of their lifetime to do the work, as I would say, fertilizing and strimming the farm where necessary, where needed. Everything works in harmony with everything else here. And it's, it's very exciting 
to be part of that. And it's very exciting to be eating from what's growing here, to be meeting someone who wants something from here to produce something else. To bump into a group of people and they say, oh, I'm bored, I have nothing to do. Well, I'll say, do you want to make cheese? Do you want to smoke uh, pork? Uh, do you want to pick berries? Do you want to make jam? Do you want to make chutney? What would you like to do? Think of something you like. We'll give you plenty to do. I can't do it all. I actually probably prefer to be out here growing stuff rather than making jam. But someone's got to make the jam too. The thing about agroforestry versus um, your conventional deciduous systems is that you can be selective and you still, as you, as you look around here, you still have your grass, you have your additional uh, arable system, horticultural system, cash crop. Um, like it was last summer, not this year, there was a neighbor looking for uh, some grass. We had a zero grazer passed down here. We took hay, we take silage, you cut the headlands, you have your berry harvest, you have your tree crop growing. I mean, everything works together. Absolutely everything. And down the line, there's no reason why different animals and different uh, species can't be introduced into this system as well. So it, the opportunities are endless. And, and I suppose traditionally, when you look at, you know, this farm and, and my home farm over the hill, the, the, the concept I would have heard growing up would have been, well, your trees, you, you lose the land. You lose the land. Look, I mean, you don't lose anything, especially in an agroforestry system. Even in this, you don't lose. But anyway, in an agroforestry system, it's a win, 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 as far as I can see. I don't see any loss here. Um, you still have grass. You still have your trees. You still have your arable system. And, uh, you know, I, I, I don't understand where that, that concept comes from. So, agroforestry, once the system is designed to suit the farm, the farmers, and the people working and using the land, the possibilities are endless, absolutely endless. And as far as loss is concerned, I don't see any, absolutely none.